hit the ground running with the most revolutionary personal training program ever developed. The National Academy of Sports Medicine, the number one choice for fitness professionals, makes it quick, easy, and affordable to learn on the go. Be your own boss and start transforming lives from 9 to 99 with the all-new certified personal training program only at NASM.org. What's going on, everybody? Tony Ambler right here, Master Instructor with NASM, and I'm extremely excited and honored to be joined by my colleague and buddy, Mr. Andre Adams. How you doing today? Doing great, Tony. Happy to be here. I'm really happy for you to be here. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar series, Physique 101. And uh, this is our first episode, first installment in the series. I've been really, really looking forward to this and uh, sharing this information with everyone. In this particular episode, we're going to talk about physique fundamentals, and um, that'll help set the stage for subsequent episodes in the series, which we'll highlight and preview a little bit as we get going today. All right, so what are we going to cover? Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We'll get going with some intros. I really want you guys to get to know Andre um, and really get a, an appreciation for his level of experience and expertise as it relates to physique development, body composition, change and bodybuilding. Then we'll talk a little bit about the series overall and, and what we plan on getting into over the next uh, few months, uh, really, uh, weeks and, and into the coming months as it relates to physique development. So we'll we'll highlight what's to come. Hopefully that'll get you excited and looking forward to our, our subsequent episodes. And then we'll spend the majority of our time getting into the fundamentals of physique. And there are a lot of different facets and components associated with physique development, training to optimize your physique and body composition that I don't know if people fully appreciate or realize. And so I want Andre to get into that for us and um, really set the stage for what's to come down the line. And then we will spend a few minutes addressing some questions that we've already received uh, about the topic. And then we'll preview our next episode before wrapping things up. So Andre, how's that sound to you? Sounds good to me, Tony. Perfect. All right. Well, let's uh, let's find out more about you. So, uh, sure. You know, Andre yeah, Adams. A little bit about my backstory here. Um, yeah. I've been in this physique and bodybuilding space uh, going on eight years now. I started out as a power lifter before that, and uh, just kind of fell in love with the sport. You know, I turned pro in the IFBB and the physique divisions back in 2013 at the NPC Nationals, and since then, I actually went on. You know, got my NASM. Uh, CPT and a lot of the other disciplines, but uh, I was fascinated with the amount of information and science that I was able to learn and apply not only to myself, but to some of my clients that I coach as well. So I actually took that all the way through uh, the NA NASM master's program, uh, which has been sort of the foundation of some of my own training. Uh, so those are things that I'd love to talk about. And as Tony mentioned, you know, looking at some of those most common objectives for improving your body composition what are those goal setting and, and you know, the strategies for uh, mindset, uh, creating those adaptations for bodybuilding? What does that look like? Um, I will say just, you know, through firsthand experience, it is quite a bit different than how we normally would think about dieting and, and training, right? There's a lot of uh, specifics and other considerations that go into it. So uh, definitely happy to speak about that and uh, use some of my expertise that I've picked up along the way. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, if, uh, obviously we'll uh, provide your contact information and social media information at the end, so you can you can learn more about Andre if you if you don't follow him already. But um, yeah, I'm excited for you to share all that with us. And I think too, as we get through this series, one of the things you and I have discussed is, you know, we can approach this from two perspectives. One is, you know, if you're an athlete yourself and you're looking to train to improve your physique and, and achieve specific goals. But then also if you're looking to coach others, uh, we'll be addressing what you need to do in order to accomplish that. Obviously you've done both. You've competed at the highest level in the sport and you've coached people to compete as well. So um, yep. I think that's what uh, will be great about the series is that we can we can approach it from both perspectives and, and really shed some light on what, what all this means and, and what, 
it takes to be able to uh, to accomplish those physique yeah. oriented goals. Absolutely. And even to add to that, right, for you guys that are out there just looking to improve your body composition, maybe you're in a transformation challenge or just looking to get in shape for, you know, your beach body this summer. All the same principles will apply to that, uh, that same kind of training as well. Yeah, fantastic. So, you know, before we uh, we let Andre do his thing and and get into some of the, the finer elements of physique and the fundamentals of physique, I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, you know, NASM historically, you know, if you kind of look at the images on the slide, we uh, we focus on sports performance training. We focus on fitness, improving fitness and wellness. Um, you know, we're the largest personal training certification in the world. And, you know, fitness is the primary space for that. And then corrective exercise is also a, another big aspect of, of what we do and, and the education that we provide. And so, as I've mentioned in, in other webinars and, and um, podcasts that we've, that we've had, one of my objectives and what I really want to highlight is, is how versatile and adaptable the systems and principles that the NASM education and OPT and corrective exercise training models are to a variety of different populations with a variety of different goals. And so I'm really excited to dive into this because I think the majority of people who are exercising have aesthetic goals. Um, I don't think it's uncommon. Obviously, uh, people want to feel better and they want to be able to do uh, specific things physically and functionally. But I think we'd be remiss to to not address the aesthetic piece. And and I think a lot of people exercise because um, they want to improve their aesthetics, which then translates to a variety of other things, improve self-confidence and, and awareness and, you know, that can translate into other aspects of, of their life. And so mm -hmm. for, for me, uh, like I said, I'm excited because uh, I want to be able to um, obviously have you share your knowledge and expertise uh, about um, developing a physique, uh, an optimal physique, whatever that might be for uh, depending on the person and uh, leveraging the principles and the science behind that, uh, as well as the principles and the science behind the OPT model and corrective exercise. And now we can blend those to be able to help people achieve their, their best body. And so that's, that's really why we're doing this is we traditionally haven't focused on this a whole lot as an organization in terms of how do you, how do you use the OPT model? How do you use the nutrition education? How do you use corrective exercise for individuals who are looking to improve their aesthetics and have these very specific physique oriented goals? And so that's, right. that's what I'm excited about. So um, that's just wanted to highlight that, you know, why are we focusing mm -hmm. on this? It's, it's a big deal. It's what a lot of people yeah. like to focus on and why they exercise. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we need to, to address it. How do we, how do we adapt our training? How do we adapt our systems and, and our model to, this type of goal or this type of adaptation. That's exactly it. I mean, when you think about the foundation of our NASM, our OPT model, right? Uh, to Tony's point, we're, we're typically science-based focusing on how to create specific adaptations to get a result and being able to leverage those uh, facts and those adaptations to get a physique result, right? A specific aesthetic look, that's pretty cool stuff. You know, so I think tying it all back into that sweet science that NASM uh, is renowned for is going to be uh, one of the highlights of this series. No doubt. All right. Well, let's get into the fundamentals of physique. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack here, obviously. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Just a, just a little bit. Um, yeah. Now we, you know, Greg Esposito, our, our awesome producer, you know, he's, he's put a time frame on me um, cause he knows I tend to go, tend to go long on things, but um, yeah, a lot to unpack here. Uh, we want to make sure we address the big rocks, but the great thing is, you know, this is a series. And so we'll be able to, uh, you know, touch on things here more at a high level. And then in subsequent episodes, we'll be able to, to really uh, do a deep dive on each of these individual components of physique. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I want to focus on first is, 
you know, what does physique mean? Uh, I, I think, you know, we're, we're assuming that people may know what, what we're talking about when we mention physique, but, you know, if somebody says, yeah, I want to focus on physique development, uh, what does that mean? Are there different levels of physique development that somebody can uh, work to attain? So, mm -hmm. you know, Dre, would you mind talking a little bit about that for, uh, for the audience? Yeah, absolutely. I think even starting, if we take a step back, right, the most common thing you hear is, hey, I want to lose weight or I want to gain weight. Mm -hmm. And as an athlete or a trainer, the first thing you got to look at is, all right, well, what are you looking to do with your body fat? or your body composition. And ultimately, how can we tie that into uh, a physique goal? So, you know, if you have, if you're a hundred pound person and you got 10% body fat, you can still be a hundred pounds and have 30% body fat. So we really want to drill down into that body composition aspect of it. And how can we create the adaptations to harden up, improve your conditioning and your overall physique. And to Tony's earlier point, you know, balancing that dichotomy of health and functional fitness, right, uh, versus bodybuilding or any kind of really uh, strict physique type of goal, that's going to be, uh, you know, one of the top priorities here. You don't want to get so one dimensional um, that you lose that functionality, right, or you start losing range of motion or flexibility. Uh, so these are all the things we try to uh, consider. And I can kind of walk you through from a physique perspective, right, if you're a bikini athlete, uh, figure, fitness, bodybuilding, physique, these are all, you know, different um, stages of development, we'll call it. Um, again, starting with body composition, building lean body mass, lean muscle tissue, and then being able to uh, be efficient at burning body fat, approving uh, aesthetics. So if you are looking to enhance your aesthetics and then potentially one day compete, uh, some of the criteria for that would be looking at aspects like left to right symmetry right? Top to bottom proportions, front to back proportions, um, you know, all these different things, overall size, uh, muscle separation, uh, definition, all these things kind of factor into aesthetics. Now, of course, if you are just looking for general health and wellness, but you want to improve your, uh, your physique and the way you look, not going to be as critical, but you know, you still want to have that balance and that shape that you're looking for. Um, and then kind of going hand in hand with that, as you start to burn that fat and you get in shape, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, cardiovascular performance. So that's another fundamental category that NASM, I think we can certainly speak to, right? Uh, again, balancing the cardiovascular performance with also uh, dialing it in and burning specifically body fat, not, not necessarily just overall calories, right? Sure. Uh, and then to Tony's earlier point, really identifying corrective uh, muscles or excuse me, muscle imbalances so that we can provide corrective exercise. And that's a big piece of it. You know, in a normal training program, we would do that in order to promote just overall performance and function, avoid injuries, muscle imbalance, et cetera. Uh, for physique, we're doing that same principle, but we're also blending in um, an aspect for aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. So if I've got a lagging muscle group, first of all, we need to identify what it is which muscles are overactive that are overcompensating. And then we go through a similar process of, you know, relaxing those overactive muscles and then building up or overworking the underactive or lagging muscle groups. Uh, so a little yeah. bit, you know, kind of parallels our normal process, but it's more specific to a physique goal. Yeah. Yeah. It gives, uh, you know, symmetry, a whole new meaning in the sense yeah. of, you know, the, the aesthetic component. And right. we talk about symmetry. Traditionally, um, we're looking at either a strength imbalance or symmetry with strength, symmetry mm -hmm. with range of motion or mobility. And um, those are all very, very important as it relates to resilience and injury prevention, um, mitigating injury risk to a certain extent. But now we can add that other aspect, which is the, the look. And right. Some of these principles, uh, uh, they certainly apply. Um, so if you have uh, an asymmetry in mobility or an asymmetry in strength and muscle activation, uh, then that would certainly affect your ability to develop um, those muscles that are involved right. in that asymmetry. So I think it, um, it it really is something that's important to address. And, and you know, Dre, would you say that that's something that 
that people kind of overlook, not yeah. necessarily the symmetry piece, but the influence of muscle balance um, neurologically, muscle length tension relationships as we refer to them, yeah. um, and kind of identify through our assessment process. Is that something that's that's typically overlooked in that regard with, uh, yeah. with those looking to enhance their physique? Absolutely. You know, I see so many different cookie cutter training programs, or maybe it's a diet program. And those things are good for just general overall fitness, right? Burning calories and uh, being physically fit. But when you start to step into the arena of a physique athlete, or even just trying to improve your aesthetics, uh, you have to really get down, drill down a little deeper, right? We've got to look at all those things we just talked about with muscle imbalances, being able to isolate specific groups, um, give you a clear example. When I first came from the powerlifting world, everything we do is with barbells for the most part, right? If you're deadlifting, if you're back squatting, if you're bench pressing heavy, uh, if you're into strongman, you do a lot of similar things with log presses and Atlas stones. You don't get that really unilateral work uh, and bilateral, you know, there's a place for each of them. But mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're looking to get into specifically bodybuilding and symmetry is, is an important piece. You need to isolate, you know, your left side of your body and your right side. Um, yeah. So there's there's just a lot more that goes into it um, to really develop and enhance the physique to get those proportions that you're looking for. And uh, when I came over, I, I know my left side it was kind of lagging. Um, everyone kind of has a lagging side. You'll notice, especially when you start to drop the body fat and you get in shape, you yeah. kind of see some of the imbalances, and it's amazing what you discover. So. One of the big ways that I was able to overcome that was doing a lot more dumbbell work instead of barbells. You know, if I'm on machines, uh, making decisions on when to work unilaterally versus bilaterally, and then even getting down into the science of it, working with a good uh, chiropractor at the time who would give adjustments and help make sure that, you know, I'm not having any adhesions or uh, pinched nerves that are limiting blood flow to one side of my body or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes time. That's what bodybuilding is about, right? It's about developing that well-rounded physique that's aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm excited for you to go into that a little bit more as we, as we get deeper into the series. Um, also just talking about, you know, what is, what is that ideal physique? I think it's going to be unique to each person. Obviously yep. if you end up working with a coach or a trainer, or if you end up being a coach or working with somebody else, you know, that's something that you'll help, uh, to determine with them, uh, along with them, and, and perhaps for them, or somebody for you, if if you're the one being trained and, and coached yourself. So, yep. um, you know the um, as far as the sport goes, being being a physique athlete versus maybe just training for an improved aesthetic. You know what um, what is what does the sport itself consist of? I know um, you know. You were on our podcast uh, a couple months ago now. Yep. I think it was in January with with Rick. Yeah, and it was a fantastic episode. And, and you started to get into to some of this. You touched on quite a few of these things at, at a high level. But you know, could you break down the sport for us? I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're IFBB pro. What does that mean? You know, uh, what yeah. are some of the different um, organization or federations rather? What are some of the different right. divisions that that people can get involved in? Because I think. Um, you know, individuals who um, who are watching and maybe aren't as familiar, they may have a preconceived idea or assumption mm -hmm. about what what it means to be a physique athlete. But if we were to just go back, you know, to the previous slide and we see a picture of you side by side, yeah, uh, one of you in board shorts, the other one in your post. Yeah, actually, let's let's pull that back up. That's actually a great talking point. It's this one, right? Yeah, you know, there's yeah, obviously, uh, it's they're both you, but. They're both uh, distinctly different versions of you. Yeah. <laughs> you're if on I go back yeah, five years before boat. that, it's completely different yet. So yeah, uh, so, yeah I, can, I can definitely help break down the, the sport, right? There are levels to this thing and just, just with any sport in general, but um, it's, it's really fascinating. We'll kind of start with just looking at the different leagues that are out there, right? And what I've, what I've kind of seen just through experience is when I'm coaching people for that initial weight loss, right? I had one of my good friends, I'll shout him out here, Charles Hansen, Big Chuck. And uh, we actually met through Quest Nutrition, working at, I think, the Arnold or Olympia Expo. And um, I, Chuck was, gosh, 420 pounds when he started his weight loss journey. Uh, he's very tall, too, so very big frame. And, you know, we got him down 100 pounds the first year. 
And then, you know, once he got past that, it's like, all right, well, let's keep going with this. I think I might want to step on stage one day. Mm -hmm. And we kept going all through last year during the pandemic. Total weight loss was about 183 pounds. Wow. And that last six month stretch was to get him prepared to step on stage for an amateur NPC show, which he did and, and earned some hardware. Uh, couldn't be more proud. And that's kind of the path I see. People lose the weight, they get in shape, and then they realize, hey, this is attainable. I want to step on stage. Now, when you get to that point, if you make that decision, all right, I want to start competing. There are a lot of different options, right? Uh, the most renowned being the league that I've competed in my whole career, which is the IFBB and NPC. Uh, NPC being National Physique Committee, that's uh, the amateur league. So that's kind of the base level, right? You can do a local regional show, qualify for a national show if you place in the top three to five. And then at the uh, NPC national level, you can qualify to earn your pro card. And then it's kind of like starting all over again, right? Now you're a small fish in a really, really big pond. And um, you have that's to, relative, that's a relative small fish. Right? <laughs> Everything's relative. <laughs> so it's like starting over again. You've got veterans in, that have been in the sport, you know, 10 to 15 years that you're trying to catch. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, but uh, so you can take that pathway, right? NPC and work your way up through the IFBB. And then ultimately your goal is to get to that Olympia level. Now uh, there are a lot of other organizations uh, much smaller in, in magnitude you know, some that come to mind would be like WBFF is another great organization, a um, little bit different in the way that they put on shows, uh, mm -hmm. actually very entertaining. And their athletes also look amazing. So it's another great organization. And then there's other ones like NSL and a lot, you know, a lot of smaller, um, we'll call them um, natural or regional leagues. Uh, they don't have quite the amount of competitors. So uh, for me, I, I was always attracted to what's the heaviest competition, right? I want to test myself against the best and the most people. Mm -hmm. And so that's what kind of attracted me down NPC and IFBB. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, in a nutshell what the organizations themselves look like. And then again, just the different tiers within them to get to that pro and then ultimately Mr. Olympia level. Okay. Awesome. And so uh, NPC, I, um, IFBB in that. So let's say, Somebody decides they they want to step on stage. They want to enter a a show, a yeah. local or regional show. Um, what what divisions are there? What options are there for individuals? And and maybe there's too many to to uh, shout out all of them or or talk about all of them. But what are some of the what are some of the options that people can look into if they they don't necessarily want to get as uh, as big um, right. as uh, as they can, maybe they mm -hmm. want, uh, you know, they're not looking to put on maximum lean body mass, but uh, are there other options for, for people right. who, uh, who maybe just want to improve their physique and, and achieve a certain look that's not quite to the professional bodybuilding level? Yeah, it's a great question. And here's the cool thing about the sport is the way that it's evolved over the last 10 to 15 years, you know, there's a division or a category for nearly everybody, right? If you think back, to the 90s or early 2000s, when you think bodybuilders, you kind of had to have the right genetic makeup to become a mass monster, right? The big guys, or if you're a woman, um, you had to be very heavily muscled, very dense, hard um, conditioning to be able to be competitive. Um, you know, since then, we've come out with all the divisions that are more attainable for the average athlete. I don't want to say average because they're still phenomenal, but we'll say people that don't have a goal or don't have the genetic makeup to become extremely massive, right? So we've got uh, men's and women's physique. Uh, and now you've also got classic physique in the men's division, which is my current division. So when you see the board shorts, that was men's physique. Okay. That was the first, um, other than the 212 bodybuilding, uh, that was the first smaller division, we'll call it in men's uh, fitness. And now you've got, if you look at that second picture, classic physique, where you can put on more mass, you can get a little bit harder, but you're still not, you know, you're not um, going to blow up to a Ronnie Coleman level. By the way, most people yeah. can't do that. <laughs> That's yeah. 1 yeah. of one percent of people. Now, so um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. Um, you know, so classic physique. If you had to kind of give an example of a of a classic physique, would that be sure. like Frank Zane or you know, mm -hmm. is that actually? Cool? You know, that's a great question, Tony. So Frank Zane, one of my all time favorites. Frank would actually be more of a, uh, I'd put him in a men's physique division. Okay. Gotcha. Men's physique today, 
Now, when men's physique first started, mm -hmm. nowhere near the level of a Frank Zane. Okay. But today, because you got to think, right, even when I started in 2011, 2012, you're training hard, you're dieting hard, you're building muscle, you're getting denser. Over four, five, six, seven years, inherently, your body is just going to grow, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so men's physique where it was when it started is nothing like it is today. Um, I, I would say all the guys that I started with that are still doing men's physique, everybody's 20 pounds heavier today, right? Really? Yeah. It's just a natural progression of training for that many years. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say Zane would be more of like a men's physique professional, you know, like Olympia level athlete today. Whereas guys like, um, let's take a Franco Colombo, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Serge Nubre. These guys would be really, really good classic physique athletes today. Gotcha. You know? Okay. Yeah. So, cool. and that's the, that's the beauty of it, right? So same thing with the women. I've had a lot of um, professional and amateur uh, female friends that have started in the bikini division, mm -hmm. which is more, uh, you, know, you know, more of your model or beach body type of division. And yeah, I think it's downplayed because people assume, oh, well, they don't carry as much muscle. They don't have to train as hard. Completely false. <laughs> These <laughs> girls are training their butts off to get in that kind of condition and hold that look. So you got to remember, it requires the same amount of discipline with dieting. And it also requires a lot of cardio, a lot of training, and then trying to create these adaptations to achieve that physique and, and play by the rules, right? There's certain rules and criteria that you're scored against. So that's what you're ultimately trying to uh, tailor or mold your body around is, is that ideal physique for that division. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, so is that what we're looking at then is physique, classic, and then... 212 bodybuilding okay. and then open bodybuilding. So that's kind of from smallest to biggest. And then if we go on the women's side, you'd have, uh, and it varies by federation, but if you look at NPC, IFBB, there's bikini, figure, those are kind of the traditional ones. Um, as of last year, 2020, they've now added the wellness division, which mm -hmm. is kind of um, women that are proportioned a little bit more bottom heavy, but you still have to have quality muscle. Um, and to be very feminine, right? So that's kind of that in-between division. And then you've got women's physique and then women's bodybuilding. Okay, great. So a lot of options. I mean, a lot of options today. You decided, you decided to undertake yeah. this uh, as, a, as a goal. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are quite a few options available. And uh, right. you know, that, that's a great thing is, you know, if, as the sport mm -hmm. has evolved, um, it's open now to, uh, to many more people, I think. And, 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 um, the idea of what's attainable and what's achievable is, right. you know, you've been, you know, I've been in fitness 22 years. And I remember, you know, when I started as a trainer, I had many friends who were into bodybuilding and competing and, you know, it, it only meant a couple things, right. There weren't, there weren't too many options. And so it's great that there are more, categories or divisions uh, available to people now who um, want to put in the work and they want to achieve a certain look, but it may not be quite to the, you know, the pro um, or, you know, mass, mass monster level, if you will. Right. So fantastic. So the, in terms of stepping on a stage, you know, we'll get into goal setting, you know, that'll be our, our next episode. We'll, we'll focus on, you know, how do you begin this journey? And part of that is goal setting. But if, um, whether you step on a stage or not, you know, the principles are fairly universal, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. you're looking to get in peak condition to, to get on stage and compete for, uh, at a particular event or show versus, getting your best body for a particular season or a particular event in your life, it's going to be very similar. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at any, any type of goal, right, we try to set those smart goals, right? The smart, uh, excuse me, specific, attainable, measurable, realistic, timely, all those things factor into a goal, no matter if you're a competitor, you're at work or you're just trying to lose 10 pounds. Right. So it kind of starts there. Uh, but then to just build outwards, <clears throat> the consistency has been the one thing that's always kept me grounded. And, you know, out of the dozens and dozens of athletes that I've coached, it's really the ones that are consistently putting in the work, you know, staying disciplined with their diet, staying disciplined with their cardio or their training. 
And then you've got to be flexible enough to pivot around things and keep yourself motivated, right? There's going to be obstacles that come up. Um, you're going to have to travel for work. Your kids are going to be sick. You're going to have to, you know, stay home from, from work and miss the gym that day. So you, you've got to be, um, I guess, flexible enough to really pivot and, and stay successful and then look for those little wins, right? From week to week, day to day, when you break down that big goal into smaller sub, sub goals, uh, you got to give yourself those little victories. And that's really what keeps you hungry, you know, and then hold yourself accountable. So one big thing in the, uh, we'll call it the physique space, if you're working with a coach is typically progress pictures. Mm -hmm. You see this with a lot of challenges, you know, first form, for instance, has the My Transformation Challenge. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you're print off uh, day one, day 40, day 90, and you're checking in, right? And yeah. holding yourself accountable. And look, there's going to be times that you really bombed it this week and you went out with your friends and had a good time or, you know, you just, you had a bad day. So you, you, you know, all your meals were off. And when you go back and look and hold yourself accountable and make the adjustments, um, all that feeds into hitting your goal. But I think the, the important part is by setting that goal, it keeps you a structured, but then B it gives you this um, extra motivation to execute. Right. So I need to get from X to Y by when, Right. When you define the when and you take the little steps every day to get from X to Y, it really just uh, helps you attain those goals. Yeah, no, uh, that's great. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, to breaking that down a little bit as we get through the series. You know, everything from, you know, what do you do from an assessment perspective? If, you know, you're coaching somebody yep. who has physique oriented goals, how do you develop a training program? Um the nutrition, when you look at the nutrition requirements, both uh, from a macronutrient and micronutrient level, you know, there's all these different things that you have to take into consideration. And then as you uh, get towards competition, you know, what does that prep look like? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so many things that, that uh, are involved that, you know, people may not, people may not realize at, at first. Yeah. So, um, so if, you know, if you're a coach, you know, or an aspiring coach, what are some, what are some key things that, um, that I would need to know if I, if I'm looking yeah. to, get into, um, if I'm looking to get into coaching somebody who, who has a physique oriented goal, um, outside of, let's say your traditional weight loss, um, mm -hmm. type client, uh, what would be the first step? Do you, I mean, do you recommend, uh, getting involved in that yourself as a coach mm -hmm. before uh, trying to, to lead others down that path? What are some, what are some of the key things that, that you want to keep in mind? Yeah. And you know, this is something that comes with um, collecting a lot of data, right? So mm -hmm. anyone who's an experienced coach, um, maybe you give some fitness and nutrition advice. It's always good if you've got back pocket, you know, a registered dietitian uh, that can help make sure that, you know, you're taking into consideration, um, some of those different things on the micro and macro nutrition level. But overall, if I'm an aspiring coach and I have a current athlete or we'll call them current client that decides, hey, I want to step on stage one day. Kind of the first things that go through my mind are what assessments do I need to uh, even analyze this individual? And for me, that kind of starts with our NA NASM overhead squat assessment. Right mm -hmm. from there, we're going to be identifying those over and under active muscles observing their body mechanics and uh, identifying those compensations, uh, just getting a real good feel for what we're starting with, any corrective exercises that need to go into their plan. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I kind of go into a cardio assessment, right? You can do your basic VO2 uh, step test, Rockport walk test, any of those just to assess, uh, again, uh, their kind of jump off point from a cardio right. perspective. Uh, but then kind of the ongoing ones, we'll call it this continuum that happens throughout a full prep would be body fat, right? So mm -hmm. every three, four weeks, I uh, highly recommend, even if it's just you as a coach doing something um, as basic as a skin fold, right? So your body fat caliper pinch test, we'll call it. Um, obviously a little bit of variability depending on who's doing the test, but it gives you directionally good information on how their body's responding to the current diet and training and what adjustments to make. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm competing myself, I like a little bit, I'm a very data-driven, very science-driven guy. Um, I like to do things like bod pod or the DEXA scans to give me a little bit more precise measurement. Yeah. Um, 
they get a little expensive, but that's something as a coach or an athlete I would recommend. Yeah, and we'll dive into those uh, some of those nuances a little bit. Um, yeah, as well, right? Yeah, right. Uh-huh. So the other thing would be like your basic circumference measurements. Yeah, right? kind of tracking, um, you know, your waistline, and there may be less. I don't want to say they're less useful, um, but we're looking at mostly aesthetics. So maybe it gives you some directional information on, okay, your left thigh is an inch smaller than your right thigh. We need to prioritize this in your training. Sure. And you know what I'm saying? It, it helps you identify some of those and balance your physique out. Um, and then of course, weekly and sometimes sometime twice a week, uh, physique check-ins. Mm-hmm. Um, when we get really close to a competition date, I actually have my, my athletes check in on Sundays and Wednesdays, um, you know, posed and unposed progress pictures, uh, body weight. And then we kind of go through how was your week, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how was your diet? Did you miss any meals? How many minutes of cardio did you execute? And we, we take that information and we use it to kind of predict where we're going in the next week. Yeah. So those are the, we'll call it the continuum of physique check-ins that you would have on a weekly basis. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm looking forward to uh, to breaking that down in the series, kind of establishing that blueprint, if you will. Um, yeah. You know, if, if you're looking to coach somebody, I think uh, just keep tuning in. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Um, it, hey, as Tony mentioned too, in, in even between episodes, feel free to reach out to either of us with any questions or uh, things that you want us to highlight on the next episodes. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And yeah. um, you know the we'll kind of finish up with this, you know, for aspiring competitors, what are some of the key things that, that they should just start to think about, you know, if they, if they feel like going down this path, I mean, what does undertaking a commitment like this look like that may, maybe a little bit different from, you know, your traditional fitness oriented goal, fitness or wellness oriented goal. You know, you and I have talked uh, a, a bit about some of the things, you know, in terms of time, the, the time commitment, yeah. the training, the nutrition, uh, the nutritional right. elements, mindset, budget. I mean, the, and then how do you factor all that in uh, with uh, within your current lifestyle um, and, and demographics? So, right. you know, what are some things that um, that we can touch on briefly and that, you know, obviously we'll get into sure. in more detail uh, down the line? Yeah. So I'm going to give you my personal number one recommendation. Have fun. When you have fun and you enjoy it, you fall in love with the process of reaching your goals. Anything is possible. So that's rule number one. Make sure whatever you're doing, you're having fun. You got to do it for the right reasons. But love things that Tony mentioned, right, from uh, budget considerations. These are real things, right? Coming out of this pandemic, there's a lot of people that, you know, may, may have been out of work last year and I've had a lot of my clients actually that were struggling to afford things like, you know, dietary supplements, vitamins or protein or a gym membership. Gyms were closed down. So all those things kind of feed into it. But again, just getting creative, working with a solid coach and, a you know, and or a registered dietitian to handle the nutrition piece. I think um, those are kind of your basic fundamentals. You need that external feedback and you, you've got to have somebody to. Uh, be your corner man, right? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it too. Yeah, and because I'll, I'll be honest, people think, you know, I've done, gosh, 25 to 30 shows, 20 of those being professional shows. People think, well, why do you even need a coach at this point? I'm no different than anyone else. I'll tell you this, when you're, here's a, here's a difference. When you're training for a physique comp- competition, you become very uh, body dysmorphic, okay? Your mind is trained to look for deficiencies, Right. You're not looking at all the great things about about your body in that moment. You're trying to find the flaws or the deficiencies so that you can improve them. Hmm. And that's why you need that external feedback for a coach to tell you if you're on pace, you know, how are you pacing against plan? And, um, you know, what adjustments do we need to make? Because after a certain point, you really can't read your own body. Yeah. You get all the pictures in the world and, you, you, you know, your eyes are drawn to the little, you know, flaws right. that maybe no one else will see. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, need, that, you need somebody talking, yeah. uh, talking you up and, um, you know, highlighting mm-hmm. all the good stuff you're doing too. Right. Or straightening you out. There might yeah. be times where you're like, Oh man, I, I had a great week. And your coach is like, no, no you're off. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to add 10 minutes of cardio every day and yeah. pull back your carbs. 
So that's why you need that. It's really hard to self-analyze and step outside your own body. Uh, but then other things that we'll cover in the in the coming series will be, I want this to be real life, right? When we talk about traveling on prep, if you've got a job like me, right? My normal W-2 day job, I have to travel a couple times a month and packing all your meals in your little ISO bag and eating every two and a half hours. Um, you know, what you're trying to do is, uh, make sure that you get a constant level of nutrition, right? You're not missing meals or spiking your glucose and insulin throughout the day. Um, that's a challenge. You know, I work in a executive level role where, you know, we work with, um, we have to report up to ownership, for instance, and these are really formal meetings. It's difficult to bring food into. So you got to get creative with this stuff. Um, and I think we'll talk about that piece maybe on the macro micronutrition segment um, and then other considerations. So different age groups, you know, different gender groups. Um, if you're pre or postnatal for women, I think there's a lot of different considerations that need uh, thought and experience if you're an aspiring competitor. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll kind of leave you with on that note is how to identify and um, when, when appropriate to use, like we'll call it fad dieting, right? We hear keto diet, Atkins diet, carb cycling, intermittent fasting, paleo, red meat diet. There's all these fads and there's a, I'll tell you this, there's a time and a place for every one of them, but mm -hmm. you know, understanding when it's appropriate and for who that's going to be the difficult part as a coach and as an athlete. Uh, so that's something we kind of work hand in hand on. If I'm working with an athlete, we keep all those tools in our toolbox and uh, there are certain times you might need to use them. Yeah. No, fantastic. Well, I think that, that does shed a little more light on, you know, just some of the considerations that uh, that have to be taken when uh, when you're looking to get into to something like this and tackling uh, a goal or um, an objective like this. So yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to getting into that. Obviously, those strategies for success and how to how to stay on track when life hits you in the face. Yep. Uh, you know, how do you plan for that? How do you account for that? And still, you know keep your eye on the prize, so to speak, and, and keep trending um, and, and tracking toward it. So yeah, uh, that's awesome. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, we've covered a lot for today as far as the, the fundamentals are concerned. And, you know, today really the intention was just to preview the series, talk about, you know, what does it mean to be a physique athlete and, you know, train to enhance your body composition and, and mm -hmm. your aesthetic and, you know, really set the table for the rest of the series, which will be ongoing. Uh, we're shooting for uh, an episode every other week, which will give us some time between episodes to solicit feedback, provide other um, content related to physique development, uh, whether it's around training, nutrition, mindset, goal setting, uh, whatever. The sky's the limit. Um, you know, and that's what, where we'll really look to you, uh, our audience, to provide us with what we should be talking about as well. We can make assumptions about you know what we think you want to learn about, but the best thing is for you to tell us what you want to learn about. And so in our, our next episode, really we're gonna we're gonna start uh, with beginning your physique journey. Where where do we begin? So using that smart goal setting framework, um, in order to figure out where you're going, you have to know where you're starting from and uh, the plan and and uh, everything you have to do is in between those two points. And so we'll we'll talk about, all right, look, you, you want to undertake this uh, as an athlete or if, if you're a coach and you're, you're working with uh, an aspiring physique athlete, where do you start? What do you do? What are the things that you have to consider and, and, and address to get somebody started on the right path? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, from there, uh, Dre, you mentioned it a little bit, but we'll get into specific assessments uh, related to, uh, more physical assessments, I would say, mm -hmm. we'll get into nutrition, macro, micronutrition considerations, and then training will be the big one, you know, as you're looking to develop a certain look and certain proportions, develop certain muscle groups, what does it take from a training perspective? How do you design a program around those things? I'm excited to get into all that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're training hard and you're an athlete, um, most athletes have aches and pains, uh, especially as you're looking to put on muscle. So, you know, what do you do in that sense? How do you modify your training? What are some strategies uh, using our NASM corrective exercise continuum that you might be able to employ to work around those things or address some of the underlying causes? Uh, we've, we've got just so much 
we're going to cover um, that, that uh, you know, I just, I just can't wait. So I'm, again, I'm excited for everyone to, uh, to learn from you uh, throughout this process. And, um, you know, I think with that, uh, I know you did get a couple questions um, and, mm -hmm. and, and some of the questions I think uh, will definitely cover the, the topics in greater detail um, in some of our subsequent episodes, but do you want to, do you know, address any, any of those questions you received over the last week or so before we sure. head out? Yeah, I can kind of speak to them at a high level. And as you said, you know, we, we can drill down and do a deep dive on them um, in those subsequent episodes. One of them was how many weight training days versus cardio sessions for men over 35. I would start that with, you know, it kind of depends on your goal, but um, just general rule of thumb, I like to aim for, you know, three to four days of, let's say 25 to 30 minutes of cardio. And then um, if you're active and you're healthy, you're looking to stay in good shape, maybe build a little muscle, um, three to five lifting sessions a week, right? Mm -hmm. And you, normally if you're starting out with three days a week, for instance, you're probably doing things like vertical loads. Uh, you're doing total body workouts to try and hit every muscle group and, um, you know, burn a lot of calories and stay functional. Um, of course, as we shift into things like this for physique, then we start to break out those training splits a little bit more specific to each muscle group and try to get a little bit more work in. Yeah. And as far as the cardio, I think another question was fasted cardio pre or post workout. Really good question. Right. So mm -hmm. we'll di definitely dive into that. I think we need to have like a whole, uh, whole episode on that one. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have to have a whole episode on cutting versus yeah. bulking. Right. Yeah. So they're both under physique and mm -hmm. bodybuilding, but um, there's going to be two completely different thought processes that go into um, building muscle and you're going to inherently gain a little bit of fat with it during that phase yeah. um, versus the fat burning, um, dialing everything in phase. Yeah. So our cardio plan is going to uh, adjust accordingly there. Um, one of them is sodium on peak week. So that's a good one. That'll be in the micronutrition piece. And I'll kind of just give you a real high level 101, right? If you're an existing athlete, you already know what I'm talking about. On peak week, you kind of go through that early depletion phase with carbs. You increase your water and your cardio typically. You're, you're trying to fully exhaust the body of glycogen, right, glucose. And during that phase, because you're water loading, you don't want to get into a state where you are diluting the amount of sodium in your body. So you'll yeah. typically add a little bit of sodium with each meal. Maybe it's hot sauce or pickles or just some table salt during those high water loading days. And part of the purpose of that is also to make sure that you're uptaking nutrition in the small intestine and still getting all that food and that nutrients up into your body. Um, and then, of course, balancing that. That's the health aspect of it, balancing that with the nutrition aspect. As you start to taper off your water and dry out, we call it, um, and you reload the carbohydrates, normally you want to back off that sodium and keep it pretty low. You want to moderate that. Uh, and the reason for that is so that you don't hold subcutaneous water heading into a competition. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, and, you know, in that kind of 12 to 24 hours out, if you're a big guy, you carry a lot of muscle, probably want a good pump on stage. So then in that short time frame right before the stage, normally guys will have a big, you know, a higher sodium meal, we'll call it. Um, so we'll talk more about that on the macronutrition, micronutrition piece. And then I believe the last question we had roll in was really lifting for strength versus hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Tony mentioned, that'll really go into detail during the training segment. Um, but just to give you guys an idea, I actually did a, an episode with, or not an episode, but um, more of a blog type of article. And I think it's the um, it's an American Fitness Magazine that NASM does, Tony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, can, we can link out to that too. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, so this was, uh, I want to say, December 2019, myself and Megan McCullough, one of my good friends, also an NASM master trainer. We both had some different pieces on there on our training, and I spoke to this exact point of how I kind of cycle through the phases, right? For me, there's really a, when I'm, we'll call it the deloading phase after competition, I revert back to that phase one, phase two, kind of strength, endurance, and stabilization phases. Yeah. When I'm really on, right, and I'm building muscle or I'm, I'm cutting into a show, it's primarily a higher volume looking for, you know, that phase three in the OPT model, the hypertrophy phase, right? The pump, you're trying to shovel as much, as much oxygenated blood and nutrients into the muscle as possible uh, so that you can promote the muscle growth. And, yeah. you know, there are specific times when I'll go into a strength or a power phase, uh, but for 75% of the time, I'm going to stay in that phase three. So 
just to give you guys kind of a teaser on uh, what's to come in those deep dives. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited for that too because I think there are a variety of different ways that we can use that OPT framework mm -hmm. to and periodized format, uh, programming format as somebody is, is working to either put on maximum muscle during a bulking phase or as they start prepping um, and, and start cutting, uh, trying to cut body fat. Yep. And so, you know, it all comes down to planning and goal setting, right? If you understand, you know, what your target date is and you mm -hmm. kind of plan backwards, you can get a better sense of what phases you're going to use and when. And uh, within each of those phases, what those different cycles, uh, what those different cycles of training look like. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is value and there is benefit to to all of them if they're used appropriately and if you follow the the recommended variables and you know what's great you know we've had uh, we've had Brad Schoenfeld on uh, I know Rick has had him on as a, a guest mm -hmm. but you know the research on hypertrophy there's more and more research coming out in terms of you know how you can train to maximize hypertrophy and there's yeah a lot of different opportunities to uh, uh, to get your muscle uh, to develop muscle and yep. and um, develop hypertrophy. And, and that's the great thing is um, within the different phases of the model, you can leverage those different variables mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of them can uh, in some form or, or fashion help you put on more lean body mass. So, yeah. Uh, and it all ties together. You know, when you talk about hypertrophy from a diet standpoint, right, when you add things like sodium and carbs, you add a vasodilator, let's say with your pre-workout, these things all enhance the pump, right? So there's so many different ways to skin a cat, we'll call it, but really all of these aspects we're talking about, they all tie together and help help you attain that goal. Yeah, can't wait. Well, um, let's uh, let's wrap it up here. Um, if you have any questions, you know, please put them in the comments section below uh, where to find us. You can find Dre, Andre Adams at Andre Adams underscore official. Yep. Um, there is no space. Um, that was a typo on my part. It's Andre <laughs> Adams underscore official. So uh, that's his Instagram. Uh, if you're not following him already, please follow him. Um, and NASM, you can find us at NASM underscore fitness. Check out our website, nasm.org, YouTube. And then we've got a variety of different podcasts. Uh, you can find those wherever you listen to podcasts. So uh, with that, look forward to uh, everyone's feedback and comments to help uh, help us figure out, you know, what we should focus on next. We have a general idea mm -hmm. as we talked about a few minutes ago, but we'd love to hear from you and make sure that we're, we're touching on the things that you want to know about as it relates to physique development. So Andre, uh, it's always a pleasure, but uh, thank you for your time and, and your expertise. Can't wait for the rest of the series and uh, to work with you more on this. Um, Estonian. And you know, thank everyone for tuning in and, uh, you know, you don't want to miss these next episodes. We might even have some special guests. So definitely check them out and uh, follow us on uh, social media for some of these upcoming series. Awesome. Yes. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.